Hey, everybody. I'm doing good. How are you doing, Adamantus? Glad to hear it. All right, let's get started. So, uh, today. Um, got something good for the stream. I'm going to try to move the dat stack into a separate process. Hey, Wesley. Um, yeah, so currently, um, you know, uh, Electron uses a multi, uh, process architecture, um, which it mostly inherits from Chromium. So there's a main process and then there's, a different process for every renderer, every, which means every window that opens up. And then actually every web view has a, a process as well. So if I start a new instance of Beaker, um, and I just have one tab open, there's actually three processes at least that are running. There's the main process in the background, there is the window process, and then there's the tab, which is in a web view. Unfortunately, the way that Electron works, there are synchronous uh, messaging calls from the renderer to the main process, which means that uh, whenever you have a lot of CPU um, work occurring in the main process, the UI can start to lag. And it's not uncommon for that to happen. Um, especially because uh, the current DAT algorithm is just it's going to be replaced with something that's a little more optimal and we're just pushing it kind of to its limits right now I did some profiling the other day and definitely found that CPU usage was the problem there's a lot of CPU usage if you have a lot of DAT work being done it's not like runaway GC no sign of a memory leak or anything like that it's just that the algorithm is taking up too much CPU so I'm gonna give a, a, a shot um, <laughs> have I thought about using Servo? Are you talking about for like, uh, for Beaker or just in general? <laughs> um, anyway, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Uh, so I'm going to try moving the DAT networking stack into its own process. Uh, if I had a solution for putting it just in its own thread, I would do that. But as far as I know, there's no workers solution for the main process right now. Uh, Node has a new worker threads API, but it's not on Electron yet. So um, that's actually not super material. The hard work is moving over all the code, getting it working correctly, and then setting up a messaging channel. Uh, so some of y'all may have seen on my tweets, you get a performance overhead whenever you um, start adding the messaging. Whenever I move anything into another process, I'm gonna to have to start sending JSONified messages back and forth, and that's gonna slow it down. And at first my benches looked really bad, but then it turns out there's kind of a warm up period, and it looks like it might be within one to two orders of magnitude of slowdown. Not great. It is a high cost. But uh, I kind of think that it may still be worth it, and over time we can, uh, find ways to cut down on that cost. Um, sending messages over IPC, I'm guessing that Chrome does that through STDIO. I'm not really sure what the messaging mechanism is that Chromium uses for its different processes. Maybe STDIO just connects the stream. At any rate, at some point it might be possible to get a memory mapped um, shared bit of memory and send messages that way, which would be much faster. 
Uh, or if we can move to workers, we can have something like transferable objects where you're actually moving the memory from one thread to another, which is a much faster way to do messaging in general. Uh, but none of those options are on the table yet, maybe in the future, but we might have to crack open the C++ and Electron if we want to do that. So for now, the plan is let's try to put together um, a version of Beaker with the DAT stack and its own hidden, it, what we'll do is we'll create a hidden browser window, and that's how we'll create another process. It's one of the, just the easiest way to do it. And uh, we'll see how it performs. Um, we'll do some benchmarks. It's a little bit tricky because, um, you know, the, uh, uh, anywhere that currently has, you know, an act, uh, interface with the with the DAT stack, it's going to have to turn into an asynchronous call. So moving the code out is going to take a little bit of work. Not too much, but a little bit. The other thing that's going to be a pain is that I think I'm going to need to make a new RPC library because my current RPC library is designed to go from the web view into the main process, but it can't do the reverse, which is what we'll need. So I may have to write a new uh Electron RPC uh, library, and so that's what we're going to be doing right now. Uh, all right, Edmantis is saying, you know, Electron's not ideal. It's um, Electron is by far the best um, option on the table right now for a couple of reasons. Um, it is very well maintained. Um, it's fairly mature. It exports everything that we need for the most part, uh, as JavaScript APIs that we can use, and it integrates Node. Integrating Node is a very hard requirement for us because the entire DAT stack is currently written in Node.js. We don't have a way to, to fix that until some other DAT stack is written. There's a Rust implementation of DAT being worked on, and once that's done, then we might have you know the ability to switch out the environment. But for now, we're going to use uh, Electron. Um, Electron is also doing work to uh, improve on the security, and in fact, in a recent release, we got the process level sandbox re-enabled, which is great. The only thing that needs to happen now is um, Electron needs to finish, um, as far as I know, they need to give us a way to audit the messaging between the window and the main process, which right now is uh, not really well um, locked down, so that's still a to-do on the security level. But for the most part, Electron has been, honestly, if it weren't for Electron, we wouldn't be able to do this. So Servo isn't really on the table at the moment. All right. Do I think we'll be able to use different DAT stack providers because of these changes, like DAT Rust instead of the current node implementation? Um, well, not in Beaker. I doubt that I'm ever going to like make the DAT stack pluggable inside of Beaker. I guess I could never, I'll never say never, but I don't know why we would do that right now. Um, that's not to say that there won't be multiple data implementations. There definitely will be. Um, in fact, I've got my fingers crossed that we'll someday be able to, someday soon be able to get the DAT Rust implementation funded. But for now, we got the Node one, and that's what we're working with. But that DAT Rust implementation is uh, underway. Yashua works on it, and it's coming along. So. If anybody's in the Rust and really wants to get involved, I'm sure that the uh, contributions would be appreciated. And there's currently an implementer's guide, a DAT implementer's guide getting written. Um, that is funded, so um, it's going to be a pretty good time to get into the Rust implementation if anybody wants to. Okay, uh, quick question. Any chances of injecting protobufs into the stack because I've already started developing a DAT VM and JSON are kind of heavy? Uh, I like protobufs. I've thought about it. Um, it would be interesting to have a protobuf library introduced into the browser. I've thought about it. Um, when you say JSON is heavy, is it the parsing and, and uh, serializing, serializing time that you're finding is, is like is it slow or is it high memory usage? What's the what do you, what have you found with the protobufs versus JSON? Because I'm amenable to that argument. I just need to hear it. How um, how much of a performance difference have you have you found with protobufs compared to, to JSON? Yeah, I'm not totally against that. 
Of course, we might be able to just have it be a user land library. I guess that really should be able to find out right now if there is one. Let's see. Of course, if it's a web implementation, it may not be as fast as a native implementation would be, so I'd have to see if there's a native implementation in Node. Hey Todd, good to see you. Glad you're here. Yeah, I'm sure that they have a web implementation now that I think about it because they have to. Otherwise, how else would they be interacting with front ends? Um, huh. Uh, they're talking about Proto 3 there. I'm surprised that they would um, not have a. Proto buffs are cool, and in fact, uh, Dad uses Proto buffs internally. Matthias is a pretty big fan. Oh, yeah, well, can't find what I'm looking for here. All right, well, let's get started on this project here. Let's get this position in. Yeah, ready. Uh, okay, first things first, we need a hidden window executor, sort of management tool. I got started on this earlier, so let's see here. This may not end up being the right strategy, but this is the one that I'm going to go with for now, just to get things started. So what I'm building here is just a sort of reusable execution environment for running scripts in a hidden window, which involves using Electron's APIs to create a window that we don't show, telling it to load a URL. That's going to be this HTML file. We're passing as a query parameter the full module path, and then we require it.
Hey Rose, glad you liked it, or at least you found it interesting. It's a work in progress. Uh, currently, I am working on um, a tool set for um, spawning hidden processes, and then I'm going to see if I can move the dat, the dat sort of networking code into the hidden process. Nancy says, would it be possible to seed sites partially instead of needing to download it fully? Uh, well, uh, just to make sure everybody understands, whenever you visit a website, you only download the parts that you need. But when you seed it, you download the site in its entirety to uh, keep it online. Yeah, it's possible we could come up with a way to um, only seed partially. In fact, there's nothing really stopping us. The reason we have it download everything whenever you do, whenever you see it, is that um, it kind of like, the idea is that you're keeping the site online in its entirety, right? Like, um, let's say that I wanted to keep the, wanted to see the Beaker website, and so I visited uh, Beaker, and then I hit the seed button. Well, at that point, maybe I've only visited the front page, so I'd be keeping the front page online, but I wouldn't be keeping the whole site online. That's kind of a tricky situation, right? So that's why we have it download the whole thing right now. So the question is really, how do we come up with like a user facing thing to explain how that works and, and make it kind of a sensible thing? That's the tricky bit. Okay. Right.
Christian, that's uh, probably what... Well, you know, that's tricky, though. Uh, yeah, that's the question. Like, um, you probably... How do you know when a mount needs to be seated or when it shouldn't be, right? Because, like, uh, maybe the mount is um, an important asset. But that might be one pathway to solving this. Well, I kind of feel like, um, ooh, I kind of feel like the answer is that the site needs to tell you a little bit like, um, we just don't have enough information to like for for somebody that wants to seed something, seed something to like know what the minimum information to seed is, right? Like, um, I if I had a uh, like a, for example, if I had a, a website that was um, dedicated to like keeping music albums online, it's a, my personal collection of music. I can imagine making it so that when you seed you automatically seed all of the code and the HTML necessary to visit the site, and then you don't automatically download all the albums, you just seed the ones that you've already downloaded. That would make a lot of sense. The problem is that as a browser, we don't have any way of knowing which assets ought to be downloaded and seeded and which shouldn't be. Um, or at least we haven't come up with one yet. Maybe the answer is to just like go ahead and download and seed anything that's HTML and JavaScript and CSS, right? Some kind of heuristic like that. Or we could have the application include a JSON file somewhere saying, hey, when you seed me, here's the minimum stuff that you should seed if you want to do like a partial seed. Could do something like that. So it's just a kind of a protocol-ish, you know, or like UI, UX question um, that we can totally fix. Um, it, you know, so maybe, maybe an idea like that. It's just I don't know what it is yet. Okay, what just happened here? Can't find module. Okay, that's somewhere here. Okay, let's try putting a Yeah, even more metadata in the that that JSON exactly right, Joshua. It'll keep a growing. Actually, I'm trying to keep it manageable. Uh, Christian, that's not a bad idea. Warning, you're about to see the 10 gig site. I think it actually right now shows you how big the site is before you do it. Yeah, we'll keep thinking about it, Adamantus. It's not a. It's a. It's a. You know, pretty sensible idea. It's just that we don't haven't hit it yet. Um, keep it simple. Whatever we're using, each user is part of the whole. Each peer has only a part of the archive and uses the file within the archive to link all the other sites he discuss. Yeah, I mean, we, uh, Ooh, aha, I got this in. Yeah, this is um, something that um, we can we can get to this eventually. We just haven't done it yet. Okay, we're getting closer. Um, CSP strikes. So we need to fix the CSP. Honestly, we ought to use a different protocol.
We'll get to y'all's questions in a second. I just need to look up some docs real quick. Okay, Rose, um, I'm guessing you're on uh, Windows. We have a known issue with copy and paste for Windows. Uh, should be fixed soon. Um, the other problem sounds also like a known issue where you got a blank screen. Hmm. There's a little bit of weirdness in some flows because uh, creating Windows or is a little broken in Electron and we haven't been able to fix that either. So it kind of sounds like two known bugs that you're running into. Copy and paste should get fixed soon. The part with PayPal, maybe not. Okay, Christian says, when a debt, when debt finds an archive being seeded by one or more, by more than one peer, do we download all the assets from one peer or try to resolve as many assets as possible from multiple peers? Uh, well, it's not a race condition, but yeah, we do try to connect to as many people as possible and download from them. Uh, and try not to, you know, download the same blocks from the same peers. You're on Linux and copy and paste failed. Hmm. I haven't heard anybody say copy and paste fails on Linux. So that's new. Uh, Adam Antis, you shouldn't need to do any sort of port opening, um, but we are working on improving the reliability of sharing. It's just just okay at this point. One thing we are going to check into soon is getting uh, plug and play, universal plug and play involved so that we can ask the router to open ports for us. Uh, there's a new networking stack being worked on that'll have an improved version of hole punching in it.
Okay, let's see if it's working. Well, I appreciate you, um, you know, sharing the word, Rose. I hope we can get those kinds of bugs fixed soon. Um, for now, we're working on the bug where sometimes the browser gets totally stutteringly slow. And here we go. It loaded. Right there. So that's good. We got hidden processes going. Make sure that the window doesn't show anything. Nope. Cool. Yeah, the hidden window is going to be, it's, oh, interesting. Um, it is sort of a hack to allocating another process in Electron. Just an easier way to do it than any other way. It's way faster than like using child process. And if you use child process, you have to deal with, um, okay, this is interesting though. Let's see if that happens again. Um, if you use child process, you have to uh, invoke Electron bytes path, and I would have to kind of spend some more time figuring out how to do that in the packaged version. In fact, I think that what we've had to do is spawn another instance of um, <laughs> I meant just I think Rose meant they'd never heard of this web browser. Anyway. Hidden window is just an easy way to create um, processes. Okay, looks like that's working. Uh, let's test real quick if I have access to the node APIs, which I need. Oh, I'm, I don't think anybody's offended. I'm glad to hear that, Rose. Okay, this didn't seem to... Hmm. That didn't work. But the read result, this got hit. If that got hit, then it seems like the file system module actually was present. So it seems like node is probably there. Now failed to load the module. And it's not telling me why. It'd be nice if you told me why. I get like a two string around right here. keep it simple you asked uh, why a distributed machine hasn't happened I mean technically the browser is right like it's a distributed execution environment so it kind of depends on what exactly you have in mind okay why am I not seeing the error do I need to oh you know what maybe I have a theory Uh, 
that running in a peer-to-peer -peer network instead of the software having to run on a host machine. I mean, that right, that's what we're doing, right? I mean, like, this is a form of a distributed computer, you know. Depends on, like, are you thinking, like, distributed computation? Like, I start a process on this computer and it parallelizes to five other computers, that kind of thing? Yeah. Uh, so distributed computation is not a part of our stack yet. It could be at some point. All right. Now I'm getting the results I need. Um, it's uh, harder. Hang on. Failed to load the module. No explanation as to why, though. I didn't get what I was hoping for. No, that's not helpful. Check some docs here. Uh, Rose, we do have an open collective. Uh, and yes, I mean, distributed Cloudflare is doing, um, yeah, it's not quite distributed computation. It's a cool VM system. And um, it's a dang shame that they're getting into that because we definitely want to get into a similar vibe. Uh, I mean, it's great that they're doing it, but I, they're totally stealing our ideas. Um, yeah, I mean, starting a, sharing computation between computers um, is difficult. Um, if you don't trust the other devices, so there's the trust aspect of it to work into it. You also um, are introducing latency, um, which and and coordination costs. And uh, so, at the moment, we don't have any special sauce for taking a task and moving it between devices. Now, what we are going to do eventually is. Um, that's going to get multi-writer, which is a tool that allows multiple computers to write to the same directory. And so what we will have is the ability for somebody to start some, like, a, attach, like, a server as a, another writer to a DAT that they have. And then, like, tell the server, okay, watch for new files in here. And then whenever you see the new file, run some computation for me and write the results to this shared folder. So that's a form of distributed computation. Uh, but it's actually, to be honest, not that different than just, like, an HTTP request. We're just using the file system as a shared interface, as a network interface, as opposed to HTTP. Okay, let's see. It's not giving me what I want. I need to do it like this. Looks like the event that I have for handling console messages does not give me every, it only gives me the first line of something getting logged, which is not really that helpful, if I'm being honest. I mean, it's better than nothing. Classes, so. 
Once you have multi-writer, you can definitely start to have multiple people's computers begin to interact through reading and writing the files in it. And it's actually a pretty cool and straightforward mechanism. You're just going to sit there and watch the file system, and when one of the other peers writes to it, you'll get an event saying, hey, a file changed. Kind of like a shared drive in a way. And then you can read the information and do some work and write to another file. Um, so it kind of becomes a mechanism. Aha, path name is not defined. Path name should be defined if this were a node environment. So let's take a look at that. Right. I mean, uh, you can definitely do some forms of distributed computation here, but uh, it kind of just depends on what exactly you're trying to accomplish. In a way, a lot of what we're doing with DAT and peer sockets, which is coming up soon, is just creating novel topologies of computing systems, making it easier for two computers that are at home to connect to each other and start doing things together. Um, node integration. Yeah, maybe path name just isn't defined. Maybe I'm crazy. Maybe there maybe deer name is the only thing that exists and I'm just totally making up this path name thing. So yeah, um, Matthias is talking a lot about something he calls uh, progressive deployment, which is um, this idea that um, with okay, um, hmm, hidden window .html time. Okay, but we're this is obviously getting somewhere. Yeah, progressive deployment. The idea with progressive deployment is um, you'll be able to uh, basically start doing computation or start a service actually inside the browser using pure sockets so people can connect to you and like do work with you. And then uh, if you wanted to, you could just move the, uh, yes, okay. Confirmed, we're working here. So like, uh, let's say I wanted to start a service like, um, a directory of users. I can open up a web page that basically goes onto the peer-to-peer -peer network and establishes that I'm a server for this thing. People can connect to me and submit their suggestions for, you know, people to be included in the directory. Just like that, you're able to run services real fast right off of your home device inside the browser. That's a great feature. Unfortunately, of course, eventually you're going to have too many people hitting you if you think it's really popular. So what do you do? Um, you want to move it out of the browser into a more powerful computer. The good news about peer sockets is that it completely abstracts away which device is running the, the service. And so what you could do is move the service into, um, into a cloud or into um, a server that you have somewhere, just a home computer even, and have it run somewhere else. And so it's a way of it's progressive deployment. You deploy initially just inside the browser, running your own application, and then you can move the, the computing unit, you know, somewhere else. Uh, and that's why we've been, that's why what Cloudflare is doing is similar to what we've been thinking about, is that eventually having a sort of uniform execution environment that can be on both on your local computer inside your browser and then moved elsewhere into like a cloud service, I think is pretty sweet. Um, so that's progressive uh, deployment, and we will probably be talking more about that over time. Okay, we got the file system here. Uh, I guess the next thing I should try is to see if I can load DAT inside of this thing. So let's try that. Specifically, I think I'll need to load Hyperdrive. And in fact, let's find out if I can load a full archive. Actually, no, that won't work out. Let's just find out if 
hyperdrive different modes. Uh, will the hidden window handle all DAT requests? Yes, it will. It will. Um, there will just be one of them, and um, every time you interact with DAT, you will hit the main process, and it will shuttle messages off to the DAT process. Did it load? It appears to have loaded. Super. I guess hyperdrive is just a function, right? Let's see what the type of shows. If this shows function, then we should be good to go, at least on the execution environment. Uh, Paul Rodwell, you're saying maybe using something like Agoric SES or something like WebAssembly isolation without containers presented in this year's Strange Loop by Tyler McMullen. I am totally on top of that. Yeah, I love what Agoric is doing. Same thing with WebAssembly. Of course, it's a really natural choice. Um, I can't wait to start integrating that stuff, and that's exactly where our head's at. All right, did it load? It did. Okay. <laughs> I went to keep it simple as saying, I hope I crack the Pied Piper problem. I went to talk to some accountants the other day and they, they saw what we were working on and were like, is this like Silicon Valley? I was like, oh, we were first, I swear. <laughs> Uh, anyway, um, I'm going to get some more coffee. So I think we've proven out the first step here. I think we've proven out the first step here, which is um, that we have a hidden process execution environment. So let's go ahead and commit this. Uh, though I need to get rid of the tests. No, we'll just leave it. We're in a feature branch, it's okay. The phrase E, the phrase E Kubernetes cloud, exactly right. Actually, while this commits, I'm going to use the bathroom. Oh, you would do that.
<laughs> it's true, my cat is famous. Famously a jerk. Uh, okay, go on. Keep it simple. <laughs> um. No. So JavaScript. Um. Just to kind of give it a sense of like JavaScript's rate of acceptance, um, I started working on Secure Skull about about five years ago, and three years ago I was shopping around what we were doing, and somebody found out it was all in JavaScript, and uh, it was like, it's not a serious project. It's in JavaScript. How can you do real distributed computing in JavaScript? I don't think that happens as much now. Like, I actually think that's finally shifted in the last three years. That now people believe that hardcore, you know, hardcore hacking happens in JavaScript now. <clears throat> Honestly, I, I don't know if I could tell you exactly why, but the Node.js community just attracted a community of programmers that are pretty hardcore without needing to use something like C++ to, to flex, I guess. Capable of it. I mean, it's not a it's, a, it's a totally arbitrary thing to focus on. So I've never... I think the reason that JavaScript is seen as um, not as serious of a programming language is that it's more accessible. But that doesn't mean that it's... Um, that just means that you're going to have more people that are earlier in their career as opposed to uh, less people that are actually really talented programmers. So it's kind of a bad heuristic. At any rate, using Node is a really good choice for us because it um, is really portable. JavaScript is really portable. So that's why the stuff gets written in Node nowadays. But then, of course, we have to get the Rust implementation done. Oh, yeah, JavaScript is slower. It's also a little bit easier to avoid foot guns. I mean, C++, it's kind of... C++ is getting better and all. But um, C++'s complexity can be a bug-introducing problem. Now with Rust, I feel like... Um, you know, Rust is such a safe language, I feel like... You know, because what I'm getting at is that with JavaScript, um, it's very hard to write... Um, the kinds of bugs that re result in compromises, for instance, because you're not going to have as many buffer overflow attacks and things like that. Or at least it's just less likely. So there's a degree to which, like, using JavaScript just lets you iterate faster. And the old meme is that you write the majority of your logic in JavaScript and then you move the performance critical parts to a native module that's written in C++ or something like that. And that's still what we do. That's what we do in that. So, use Rust to save feet. Oh, right. To avoid the foot guns, right. Yeah, I mean, JavaScript is definitely slow. And it's also really easy to write memory leaks in JavaScript. Real easy. Okay, of course, it's really easy to do that in C as well, even easier. Okay, uh, what am I doing here? I guess the next thing I ought to do 
is just triple check that hyperdrive is going to work inside of this thing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to install the dat node module as a sort of convenience real quick. I don't normally use dat node. I use the lower level modules, but with dat node I can really easily load up a dat off the network because it's just so high level. So this would be a real fast way for me to test if that stack is even capable of running inside the browser window or if there's some weird something that's going to stop me. Let's get some... See what happens. <sighs> yeah, thanks for joining us, Rose. Yeah, I mean, programming world moves ridiculously fast, so, yeah. Node.js is what made JavaScript, I think, really advance as quickly as it did, because then it was able to be used in back, like, uh, off outside of the browser, which means it could start doing more interesting things, because browsers kind of kept them constrained. And so now, the goal is to make the browser more interesting. Yeah, nodes nodes the reason that JS is now a more hardcore language. Because, you know, as an example, dat is only possible in the JavaScript because node. So
Uh, Adamantis, if you uh, if you never use GitHub, that makes it harder. Uh, this the process is temporary. Um, if you want it, uh, you can just email me, and I'd be happy to do it that way. Um, well, Hashbase is how you keep it online. Oh, come on, what's going on here? Ah. Hashbase keeps it online, but you need, um, you're talking about the Explore page, right, Adamantis? Uh, just email me. Um, make sure that you're, whoa. Wow, interesting. Uh, can I not chat? I can apparently not chat. Uh, it's pfrazy at gmail. Yeah. <laughs> Weird. Uh, you probably do want to put uh, your website on some kind of public peer, either one that you run or hash base, just to make sure I can get to it, make sure that other people can get to it reliably. Um, and then, yeah, uh, include a um, screenshot. Let me know which category you would think it should be under, and uh, give a name and a description, and uh, we'll get it under. It's our doing things that don't scale solution. All right, cool. Uh, speaking of, I was thinking about putting an email address inside a beaker so people can get in touch with us more easily because github is obviously not for everybody so definitely good to be have a support channel open i wouldn't give my peeper easy one i would do like support at peekerbrowser.com okay hit me Okay, um, this is like the the dat short address isn't working for you, or is it the HTTP version? I can check this real fast if you put um. It says DNS sent on, hold on, okay. Um, so you're not gonna be able to put a link in the uh, chat, but if you tell me your username and the name of the uh, the dat, I can take a look at your page real quick and see if anything uh, jumps out at me as a problem. One thing that we haven't fixed that we need to fix is that uh, you can't use uppercase letters, but the stupid thing lets you put in an uppercase letter, so people, you know, unsurprisingly, that causes a problem. I think I'm done with this playlist. Oh boy, it's taking forever. Starting to feel like getting one of those new MacBook Airs would be pretty sweet. In fact, now would be a great time to take a look at the product page. I have gotten so much value out of this MacBook Air that I use right now. I have, uh, Nothing but positive to say about it. It's a great experience. So I would definitely consider buying the new one, which is apparently pretty fast. Which gets me excited. 
And these things are super affordable for an Apple product for sure. All right, so they raised the price this time around. Hmm. Not that much, about $100 more. If I remember right, I paid $800 for this computer. And I've used it as my primary device for uh, like five years-ish, four or five years. Totally worth it. Actually, the main reason I wouldn't just go and buy one of them right now is that I really personally dislike um, having more than one laptop, more than one device in general. I feel so wasteful having a perfectly good MacBook that's just not quite as fast as I want. It's not like I have to get the faster one, so... Just feels wasteful. Okay, what is a turbo boost? Apple is marketing the uh, MacBook Air 1.6 gigahertz dual core processor with turbo boost up to 3.6 gigahertz. Is that like an overclock? Does that, I assume it's an overclock if you're listing another clock rate. Does it some do this on demand? I guess I need to take a look and not just be, be snide about it. Yeah, I'm rocking four gigs of RAM right now, if you can believe it. I could definitely believe it, given how long this build is taking. Yeah, if I could just uh, boost my RAM and actually get a bigger hard drive, those are the two things that made this device slightly subpar. <laughs> uh, look at me, I am the support now. Uh, okay, you can't log into... Really, you can't log into Hashbase. Okay, we're back in action. Um, yeah, it's too bad that Mac OS doesn't let you boot Linux anymore. Of course, it is a Linux, good enough for me. Well, it's a Unix variant. Um... So you can't, let me try logging in real quick. And hopefully my chat isn't still, you know what, maybe I should refresh this chat. Because like if they can't, y'all can't get to me. Yeah, this isn't looking encouraging. Somebody say something, I'm going to give it like five seconds and if it doesn't update, I'm going to, it's kind of a pain to, to Looking frozen. All right, well, we'll um, let's see if I can't log in. Okay, I can log in, so let's, okay. Yeah, well, I saw Joshua's, so. Holy cow, this is never gonna finish compiling. What was I even doing? Yeah, you really don't need to switch to Linux for coding because Mac OS is, um, is Darwin. It's a Unix variant. Adamantus, I was able to um, log into Hashbase. Of course, now Windows is um, getting the Linux subsystem, whatever they call that. So... Up is down, black is white. Windows is Linux. Adamantus machine. You got capitals in your name. 
I think that's probably okay. And then what, which, which, um, Yeah, Mac machines do charge you a premium, no doubt about that. So, Adamantis is just not letting you log in, huh? Bad state. That's unusual. Hey, that is working in the hidden process. That's good news. Okay, Adamantus. Uh, maybe I don't know. Try it, the error it's giving you is the form is entered in an invalid state. That's really odd. Yeah. Doesn't sound like a password issue, that sounds like a broken, broke ass service issue. Okay. Oh, is it gonna crash on me? No, good. Okay. Okay, well, this is really good news. The, uh, yeah, there it is. DAT is running in the hidden process. That's success. So now I just need to remove DAT node. I don't even want that in there. Okay. So the hidden process is working. Okay, Adamantus, keep me updated on that. I'm sorry that it's causing you problems. Yeah, I mean, Linux is great, so. Okay, what next? Uh, I don't think there's any way to get around the fact that I need to solve my PCs. And the RPC needs to do... Oh, brother, it needs to do streams and it needs to do async methods. And promises, and those are pretty much everything that I need. Ouch. Okay. Ugh, this is going to be such a pain. This is the part that I really don't want to do. I have an RPC library, seems to work, but it is designed to send and receive messages in the wrong direction, so I gotta fix that. Mm. Uh, Beaker is running VAES, but um, that doesn't give us extension support if you're thinking like traditional web extensions. But uh, what we are going to do pretty soon is start to do the thick applications like thing. Since I don't really want to work on this, and I want a reason to procrastinate, I'm going to procrastinate by talking about this instead. Um, Alright, let me find the wiki here. So, we're going to be getting into this pretty dang soon, I think. 
We yeah, ad blocking. Actually, we did, uh, had an ad blocker for a little bit, but it, it was an upstream module that got broken. We'll restore that at some point. But oh gosh, you can't send the chat. Let me try just refreshing this thing. Fingers crossed. Okay, then sign in. It wants me to sign in. Wow, I wonder if that's what happened. Why did I sign out of YouTube? Right in the middle of streaming, you'd think it would keep that session going. Okay. There we go. So, you know, ad blocking requires, like, hooking into the networking stack. We may end up creating a solution for that, but basically what we've been thinking is web extensions, the web extensions platform uh, requires a lot of work for us to implement, and I don't love it. I think it did some great things, uh, but I think now that it is kind of not the best solution. The main thing uh, is that web extensions are totally detached from the rest of the web experience. You have to go to a custom app store that the browser provides. So I don't like that. I would prefer that it was kind of more integrated into the web itself and part of the web platform. In fact, to my thinking, I think that a given web application ought to be able to register UI elements like something up in the nav bar. We can talk about that in a, in a second. I don't think it will be a problem. Uh, you know, hopefully the cryptocurrency money won't be a problem either, but that's everybody's got that problem. Uh, yeah, so I want to basically combine web extensions and web applications. Like These are features that web applications ought to be able to install. That's my, my thinking. So we ought to be building more powerful web applications and moving things that web extensions traditionally do into the app model. So I'm not going to do the web extensions uh, platform in Beaker. That's the plan right now. Instead, we're going to try to do something new and better. On top of that, I think that the model of injecting JavaScript into the page was great, but really brittle and just asking for danger. So instead, I want to create a plugin architecture that allows applications to request the plugin and then load it in a structured way so that there's a well-defined interface between the application and the plugin. An example of that would be, and this is where Gork SES will come in, stuff like that. Here's a really good example. Suppose you have an application like Twitter and, uh, you know, like Twitter, right? Our custom Twitter app and you want to have um, the ability for users to create their own kind of posts. Totally reasonable thing to do. You're trying to make the application open and extensible to everybody, so wouldn't it be great if your Twitter clone had the ability for users to create like an alternative kind of post, kind of like how you know, Instagram could be in a, was integrated with uh, Twitter for a while, or SoundCloud, right? You get these cards that have a little UI for playing a song. So you could just create a model where you could, uh, the user could specify plugins that add new kinds of post content that could get loaded into the feed. And um, so what the, the model would be that the application says, hey, I take plugins that are JavaScript modules that add feed content types, and I will load those plugins, the application will do it, and then I'll call out to the plugin whenever it's an appropriate time, and then the plugin can give me back HTML to render whatever I need to, to do. That's how I think plugins should advance in the future. Sort of a, the application and the plugins working together. So, that's what I plan to push forward instead of web extensions. Um, a DB solution you can implement because you're coding login authentication in ILS right now. Could you expand on that question? Okay, I can't put this off anymore. I need to implement my 
the RPC. Why do I have so many synchronous messaging calls in my RPC library? I'm not sure that this is right. I think these should all be async. Except for this one, maybe. Make an archive request from the app using the JSON and then the archive returns table data without having to implement a node instance in the middle logic for the archive of our machine. So you're asking like how can you use that to as a database, basically? While you are coming up with a response to that, I'm realizing that I have all these synchronous messaging calls inside of my RPC library that I don't think should be there and might be part of the reason that we have performance problems. This might actually be exacerbating the, uh, the um, perceived jank because synchronous messaging calls to the main process are the root of all jank in Electron. So I am going to see if I can't get rid of these. Okay, let's start with this.
so, um, to answer your question. Okay, here we go. Answer your question. Um, we're working on improving the tooling around that. You can actually use the file system more or less as a database, and we've been doing that for a while with apps like Fritter, but the usability isn't great. There's a couple of problems with it. So we're working on that. So I kind of feel like I, the only thing I can say right now is um, and tight. Okay, let's see if that worked. Um, it's just not very, it's, um, not as easy to use as it should be. I think I've seen errors here. Uh, it's, um, you're basically writing records as files. Okay, that's interesting. And uh, then you need to, so there's really a couple things. You, you're, you're basically sort of using the, the file system as a key value store. You write your records as JSON files and the path to the file is the key name, which is a totally fine idea, works great. Uh, what you have to do on top of that is um, aggregate and index the data. So you need a secondary indexer where you can do things like run queries. Um, and it's not just, super, super intuitive. Um, if you want to see what this is like, I did create a library that's designed to, to try to make it easy to do, but it didn't really accomplish that goal, I think. I think people had trouble wrapping their heads around it. So I'm kind of working on a better tool set, but I called it WebDB. Let me grab the link. Huh, okay, I had a mantis. Um, yeah, can you tell me what the error is? Like, copy paste it for me. Okay, so when something is not returned. Yeah, okay, we changed the behavior. Bad CSRF. 
Why is the CSRO failing on you? And Mantis, are you using any, like, um, you're using the normal hash-based login form and you're not, um, do you have any, like, extensions running that could possibly futz with the login process? Okay. This actually worked. So now, I'm going to find out if this works inside a beaker. Hmm. It's not good. Well, I hate to do this to the whole world, but I'm just going to restart Hashbase and see if that fixes it. All right, try again in uh, about 30 seconds. Okay, I'm just testing to see if this change that I made worked, and a good way to test that is just to see if uh, the streams work correctly, which is what I'm fussing with. So if the streams are working correctly, changing this will update here, and it didn't. Pretty sure that should have. Any errors in here? No. That's a shame. Works now. Glad to hear that. Not glad to hear that about Hashbase, though. That's not another quality moment for Hashbase. Okay. Well, let's try running the tests. Well, it's uh, been a while since they aired, so I feel like I can talk about this. Anybody here watch StarCraft II tournaments? Any um, eSports fans? WCS was pretty enjoyable, I felt. I really enjoyed it. My guy did not win. Didn't enjoy that part. The rest I liked. Ah, that's not good. That archive is not defined. I could just be tests being weird. DRG. 
I don't know what DRG is. Um, no DNS record found for beaker pad dot hash based. Uh, yeah, try trying to make it lowercase. Um, keep it simple. Yeah, I mean, I'm probably not going to mess with WebDB. I'm going to try to come up with something that works a little better. I, I'm just not totally satisfied with uh, WebDB, but um, I probably won't touch it, so feel free to, you know, put it to work. I, I, I don't know DRG. I'm guessing that's a player, right? I know, um, I mean, I know most of the players in uh, the WCS. Maru was my guy. I was all about Maru. <laughs> uh, HTTPS is slow, huh? Don't know where that would be. Yeah, I really don't, couldn't guess what that's about. Uh, what, uh, what league is DRG in? Is he Korean? Yeah, I meant to say, I haven't heard that HTTPS is slow, so that's, that's, that's a new one. Oh, race condition in the test runner. Either that or this is totally not working. Huh. Adamantus, yeah, that makes sense. Sorry about that. I just don't have enough time to work on hash space, so stupid stuff like that ends up being a problem. I really need to get around to it. So yeah, sorry about that one. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, Wes, I just got into, um, I just got into StarCraft this year. So if he's if he played before this year, I wouldn't necessarily know of him. Okay, this is not encouraging. This makes me think that there's a bug. Uh, Multi-Rider is... has been on the horizon for a long time. Matthias is just hard at work on it. I'm hoping it's going to be six months, no more. There's a lot of UI, UX stuff we have to figure out too. It's going to be a complicated feature. Huh, nothing wants to run here.
Uh, I wish I could play StarCraft 2. I don't have any devices that can run it right now. I have um, my MacBook Air can't manage the load, and uh, I only have Linux installed on my desktop at the moment, so I can't play. But uh, I just watch. Really enjoy it. Um. Uh, we don't currently, um, gosh, I'm sorry, I don't know how to say your name. Um, we don't currently, um, have a solution for that, I'm sorry. Something is failing here, but I don't know what. Right on, keep it simple. Thanks for hanging. See you next time.
Can't get my tests to run. Not sure what's going on. Probably a bug introduced into the RPC library, but not clear what it is. Just saw somebody on Twitter mention in and out and I'm dying for a burger. Terrible.
Oh man, this is the pain. So, this thing I've been trying to fix quietly to myself for a while is actually um, it's a, kind of a weird bug that manifests inside of uh, a test runner every once in a while, and it's the, uh, for some reason, I can't get it to execute JavaScript inside the window shell every once in a while. It is a total, total pain. No, it's working, of course. Well, I'll take what I can get. Definitely some kind of a timing bug inside the electron. Look at that console go. That's some hacker shit right there. Okay, well, that archive API tests work. Let's check the synced folder tests. If these work, I think the RPC library could be good to go. Okay. Well, that's good, you know, reduce the amount of... Mm, I don't know, reduce the amount of synchronous messaging that occurs. So let's commit that. Okay, let's get back to what I was originally going to do, which is implementing import and export APIs with the 
environment change. Sublime just crashed. It's cool. Wouldn't do anything. Gotta wait for that to restore. Basically, I think it should be possible to just detect whether or not I'm in the renderer or in the main process and then just swap out some methods accordingly. That's what I'm hoping I can do here. The only difference is that you can't send synchronous messages from the main process to a renderer. Minor difference. Shouldn't be a big deal now that I've removed a lot of those synchronous message calls. So let me just kind of looks like the APIs are a little bit different though. Does look like they are slightly different. So maybe I need to extract them. Maybe not. Oh, they are slightly different. That would figure. Okay.
you know, it's been two hours. I think maybe I'm going to wrap it up. I'm going to keep working on this, but I could use a walk. A little break. I think I'm going to call it there. Uh, but thanks for tuning in, everybody. Uh, I'm going to keep on working on this. We did manage to prove a couple of things. We got a background process render, uh, background process manager going, which is good. Managed to prove that DAT can run inside that background process, also good. Now I'm just working on updating the RPC library that I use so that it can export and import APIs in both directions. Right now it's sort of unidirectional and that limitation I had to fix. And then I'm gonna to have to start moving the code into the other process. Uh, so, I bet I can get done with this RPC library bit within an hour once I finish wrapping my head around everything that needs to happen. Uh, and then moving the actual code into its own process? I don't know, that'll take a little bit longer. We'll see. Not totally sure I'll get this done tonight, but I might. I might just let myself enjoy the rest of my Sunday. Oh, but I bet you by next week, by the next live stream, I'll have managed to get this prototyping done and then we can find out. We can find out if uh, moving debt into a separate process is worth it. <laughs> I give it 50-50. The overhead of the messaging is pretty bad. But we'll see. So thanks everybody for kind of coming. Uh, as always, you can reach me online, uh, IRC, Twitter, GitHub, and email. So feel free to reach out. Um, and uh, I'll see you next week, same time as always, 2 p.m. Central. So have a good rest of your weekend.